Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. And of course, we're going to be dealing with a couple of subjects tonight. Uh, breaking, of course, that came out earlier today. Uh, President Putin weighed in uh, in a televised interview on Russia's 24 uh, television broadcast there. Uh, what if, the question was asked, what if Kiev tries to retake the territory during the World Cup? According to the translators, I think it will have very serious consequences for Ukraine statehood. Wow, now that could be very serious right there for President Putin to put it so bluntly in what he had to say. Uh, and to top that off, this came out two hours ago from the president of Russia himself, Putin, uh, stating here, uh, a Kremlin release, it is important to simplify the Russian citizenship procedure for refugees from Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic. Now, I'm taking this, that this is uh, more along the lines of how to deal with the refugee situation because there are a lot of refugees that have uh, fled the war-torn region of Donetsk and Luhansk regions that are now self-proclaimed republics. They are also using the Russian currency there. Uh, the rubles and are backed by Russia with humanitarian aid and even uh, the Wagner Group uh, very much in helping with their defenses inside the country. Uh, that being stated, though, you know, you also can't help but wonder if, if there does break out a serious war, if Russia will not absorb uh, this part of eastern Ukraine back into their own uh, government. I say this, but let me tell you something that it's kind of, um, how would you call it? I, I don't even know the right expression to say this, but you know, I've watched so much news coming out of mainstream media ever since the whole um, uh, Maidan coup took place in Ukraine, which we covered heavily. Uh, we have friends that live in Ukraine, and uh, we were covering, uh, actually from even the pro-Ukrainian side, uh, we have friends on both sides, uh, the ethnic Russian side as well as the pro-Ukrainian side, getting uh, input of what was happening, even about the deaths of the people that were unarmed. And I was asking, why are they doing this? And uh, one good friend of mine lives in New York now that uh, was from Ukraine, said that they were so poor and yet they were being paid to go out and protest. And they didn't care if they got killed or not. It made it look better for public perception. But here's what gets me. On all mainstream media, still to this day, everyone blames Russia. Russia coming over through the country. Russia wanted to take it over, so Russia did it. All right, now, let's just for a moment really think of the logic of that statement. Now, it's been spread so much and so far that everyone believes it. Well, practically everyone believes it. A lot of people are a little bit smarter than that. I say this because, after all, think of the logic of that statement. It was President Yokanovich who was the duly elected leader of Ukraine at the time, a pro-Russian leader who kind of wanted his cake and eat it too. He wanted to be part of the European Union, and at the same time, he wanted his people to save money on their gas, so he didn't want it to come from the European Union. He wanted it to come from Russia, because after all, he was very loyal to President Putin. And when the Maidan coup began, he sought Russia's help to save his life. Well, if Russia was the country trying to topple him with this coup, then why didn't the United States come to this man's rescue? Why did President Yukonovich call President Putin and ask to be rescued and was rescued by the Russian military and was evacuated? And as far as I know, he's still in exile in Russia. I say as far as I know. I don't know for sure if that's where he has remained, but that's where he went. Does that sound like a Russian coup and a Russian uh, determination to topple the country or a Russian invasion to you? Think of the logic. I mean, they really must think we're that stupid to believe that Russia was the cause of this. 
If Russia was the one that rescued the president, and Russia was the one that had to take him in exile, then how could Russia be the one overthrowing the country? That's insulting your intelligence, no doubt about it. All right, we're fixing to turn to another subject here in just a moment here. Prophetic insights on Gaza. Uh, and I really have to think, you know, sometimes when people put the comments out there, they have no idea how much of a blessing it is, even if it's against what I have been saying. Uh, it can be a blessing because it makes you dig deeper. It makes you search and it makes you get more scriptures that only confirm what God has already showed me about the whole issue with Gaza anyway. But before I do, there is a major uproar. I say a major, I don't know. There's a handful of people that really got upset uh, with me uh, over the issue of um, uh, Van Jones and the statement that I said about Van Jones in the broadcast yesterday. In fact, it was so many people making the comments because, in my opinion, truly misunderstanding what I said, uh, that we had a lot of people coming on and saying, or even my wife said on other <laughs> videos saying, you need to apologize for standing with Van Jones. Well, one brother even wrote my wife, and it was to me it was not a very Christian way to respond. I, people know my email address, stephenbenoon at gmail.com. And uh, I, of course, you know, also get hundreds of emails, but uh, she asked him to stop emailing even because of the way he was responding that I should have researched more before I made a statement about Van Jones. Now, I don't know Van Jones personally, and I don't know that much about him. I've seen him from time to time. Uh, because on Twitter, I like to see what the opposition media says out there to begin with. But most of the people, it seemed, that were in the chat room last night did understand what my point was. All right? He was very passionate about what he said. And as I noted, and even the brother that wrote my wife, he said as well, you said you had not researched it that much, but you should have. The issue was, was not about whether or not the White House what their comment was made about or what the whole issue was in regards to in his statement. My stand with Mr. Jones was that the black Americans in this, in the country of the United States, I say this country because I'm an American as well, have fought and died for the freedoms of the United States. This is what I stood with him on, standing that yes, there have been many of the black people in America have not had the privileges uh, through our history in our country because of slavery and then coming out of slavery. I mean, I, I grew up in the early 60s, you know, so I remember it. I remember the way things were, uh, not as much as it was in the 50s, of course, but, you know, I've seen the prejudices even uh, late 60s for me, or, uh, late, late 60s, mid 70s. I saw the prejudices that happened against the black people. And especially living in the South, you know, I'm from Alabama, so, uh, you know, I've seen these type things. This is where I was standing with Mr. Jones was on that issue there. And of course, as you recall, the next thing I did is I took this subject to what was shared with me, but I didn't reshare that information again, but I'll say it now, that when Obama was president of the United States, I met with one of his Secret Service agents at the time who shared with me that the U.S. government was looking for ways to bring about a racial divide in the nation. That's the only reason I brought the issue up. You know, for me, it wasn't a matter of really needing to know what the story was about, why he was so upset. It was only the fact that, yes, the black American people have really suffered a lot in America, and as well, they have contributed greatly uh, to our freedoms around the world. You know, I can't say that every war that we've done has been justified by no means, but still, we, we still believe that we are fighting for liberty and justice for all. And the thing is, that is my stand with Mr. Jones. Now, what he represents on other issues, things like that, I have no idea. You know, and I do know that President Trump does, has really been big on the people not standing for the Pledge of Allegiance uh, or the National Anthem, things like that. I agree with the president on that. I think that we should. If we're Americans, we should. 
You know, in fact, I also believe that God should have not been taken out of the schools. Prayer should have never been removed. Bible should have not been removed out of schools. I mean, we could really go into a deep list of this. All right. But that that's I just wanted to clarify that because, you know, sometimes people misunderstand what you're saying, especially for me, because if you're dyslexic like I am, I may go from one thought to another and not really clarify what my position is. And I think that's where people misunderstood. That's why I did try to say, I don't really know what the subject was about as far as what the White House may or may, or may not have said. Um, you know, so this was where I really wanted to, to deal with that issue there is to make that more clear, you know. I don't know about that. I mean, I know a little bit more now because of uh, this being stirred up, but that was not my point. My point strictly was the sacrifice that our black brothers and sisters have given to this country and for the freedoms, just like every other nationality we have in America, you know, because it's not just black America. We have the Anglo-Saxon, and I even went into that, how that we're really all immigrants into the country other than the Native Americans. This is why I went that route. I went down that route. The only true American, as I said, was the Native Americans, you know? Otherwise, we're, we're all coming in, you know? Unfortunately, the black people came in as slaves for the most part, and that's a stain on the American flag. What happened to, the, uh, to black America? But we can't change that part of our history now. And so that was my only um, point in trying to point out about Mr. Jones. As far as what he was really implying his debate about, that could be a different issue altogether. And that's not something I was interested in. I don't want to waste more time with that, but I want to clarify that. I did remove the video, and maybe I should not have removed the video, but I thought if it causes that much confusion that quickly, the last thing I wanted to see is to have more people misunderstand something, especially when people start, uh, you know, you put the comments in the chat not understanding, and, uh, you know, it, it would be better if you just simply say, brother, you know, maybe I misunderstood you, you know, wh why would you stand with this man? I don't understand that. Uh, that's more the Christian way to handle it, you know, because this is what Jesus taught us. If you have a, 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 an ought against your brother, go to him. Go to him privately, discuss it with him, you know, because, uh, I mean, a lot of people have a lot of differences with me, and I understand that, uh, you know, and I know the issue about Gaza and the Palestinians. There's a lot of people, not very, I shouldn't say a lot. There's a handful of people that are not very happy about some of the stances that I've taken um, more recently. And it's mainly I take this because I am Jewish by birth. Both my parents were Jews. Uh, my whole family, every name in our family are all Jewish names, mother and father side both. And, um, you know, our lineage goes way back. We're one of the families that even through a, um, through the, uh, as they call it, the verbal tradition, where our, our whole family line comes down as believer, being of the belief that we are descendant from Joshua's uh, uh, blood lineage. Now, the funny thing is, this is what's really interesting. Uh, it's a little bit thing off the note here. Some rabbis say that Joshua never had children. He never got married because there is no biblical proof for that that we have today. And I've always wondered about that. And then I would think to myself, well, if that's the case, maybe we're not part of Joshua's bloodline. Uh, I've got a cousin here in Prague, and uh, he says, no, we're actually Levites. We come from uh, Moses' uh, bloodline. And, of course, we can always debate that, but, you know, most of my family all believe that we come from Joshua. Well, oddly enough, I was reading in the book of Baruch recently, and in Baruch, he actually writes about when God sent Moses Aaron and Miriam to the children uh, of Israel down in Egypt, just like we have in our own canon. God also attributes Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, includes Miriam as a prophetess. But then Barak also added, and he sent Joshua and Caleb and the sons of Nun. That really blessed my heart. That let me know then that, yes, Joshua did have children because Barak actually wrote about them. Uh, and spoke about his sons being a light to the world. So it's kind of a blessing for me. Anyway, all right. Uh, that, in the book of Baruch, I, I, I don't know. 
you know, you can see it online, and I don't know if you can search that or not, but uh, that was, I don't even know what chapter it was in. Somebody asked that in the comment section there. Uh, we're going to go back into Zephaniah. Now, this was really a blessing, and I got to, you know, sometimes maybe I should just read the comments to you guys because, uh, you know, if, if people are willing to put the comment publicly, then maybe we should read the comments because sometimes uh, I think people are really wanting to give me a good sock when they think I'm doing something wrong. And, and I appreciate that. I, I don't I don't take offense to it uh, for the most part, you know, uh, but, you know, like I said, sometimes the comments are a blessing because I dig deeper. And when I was speaking about Gaza, uh, I really caught some heavy flack over this and uh, uh, with a small group of people there and they were saying, you know, well, Steve, you know, you totally forgot about the prophecy in Zephaniah where once again, God is going to wipe out Gaza. Now, I had a feeling, though, that the sister that made the comment had not seen the video I did on um, on, the, on Gaza and prophecy in, in the book of Amos. And we're going to jump back to that in just a moment as well. But she quoted Zechariah, and I believe that's cha Zephaniah, excuse me, chapter 2 here. And we're going to look at this because it actually complements what I shared with you guys the other day on Amos. And we're going to go back to Amos as well because there's a lot of things that people miss about Amos. And I want to share that with you uh, as we go back to it. So once again, the first three verses set the time frame. That's interesting. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O shameless nation. Before the decree bring forth the day when one passeth as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you, seek you the Lord, all you humble of the earth, that have executed his ordinance, that's like his commandments, all right? Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. So see, there is a hiding away of God's people when his anger comes, all right? Now here's where I was, my attention was to be drawn to. For Gaza shall be forsaken. And Ashkelon, a desolation, they shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Now, when you read that verse right there, it's as if Gaza, everything is applying to Gaza. But I'm going to show you what it really stands for. Woe well, unto the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Carathites, the word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, and there shall be no inhabitant. All right. Now, the land of the Philistines. What's interesting, though, is it's not Philistines living in the land anymore. It's just called the land of the Philistines. All right. Here's what we got to look at, though, is how these words are being played out, and as well, what is the area he's talking about? For Gaza shall be forsaken. Now, the word forsaken in Hebrew right here, uh, az azrovah, has nothing to do with being destroyed. Forsaken. Just like I shared with you in Amos the other day. Who was forsaken? It was the Jews living in Gaza that were forsaken. Forsaken by who? The Israeli government. Now, I've heard two different stories on this, and I haven't come to the bottom of it as of yet. I know that Prime Minister Netanyahu resigned at the time that Ariel Sharon forsook the people of Gaza. But I've also heard that he was kind of forced into voting for this resolution of moving the four stages, because remember, Amos talks about for four, three and for four transgressions. This was all about the Jewish settlements inside of Gaza. All right. Now, that's what that applied to. But for Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon become, is the one that becomes a desolate. And they shall drive out what? Ashdod at noonday and Ekron shall be rooted up. All right. Let's take a look at this on the map then. All right. Here we are. Here we are right here. I want to show you something. Now, right there where you see that little red dot, that is where Ekron is. Now, a lot of times we know, I say we, as far as Israeli people know, 
by archaeological discoveries what areas are what. Okay, Ekron is way up here. In fact, it's actually not far from uh, where I used to live at originally in Israel, which is uh, uh, in uh, Rishon. I lived at a kibbutz there in, in uh, Rishon. And then just to the southwest on the coastline, we have Ashdod. And then, of course, a little further south, we have Ashkelon. Ashkelon is here. Ashdod is here for those that may not be able to see that very well. And Gaza is further south from Ashkelon. So the places that are going to be desolate, rooted up, overthrown, kicked out, all those kind of things, have nothing to do with the Palestinians who live in Gaza. It has everything to do with what? Ashkelon, Ashdod, and of course, uh, the last place that we had mentioned over there, Ekerot there, uh, Ekeron. All right, Gaza is only being forsaken. That's what it says about uh, Gaza. They're forsaken. Is it forsaken by God? Well, if we're going to try to make the scripture come together, we have to kind of look at what Amos says about all this. All right. Now, Amos starts off. All right. We know he's the, uh, the herdman of Tekoa. He saw come the coming Israel in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. And he said, The Lord roareth from Zion, and uttereth his voice from Jerusalem, and pastures of the shepherds shall mourn, and the top of Carmel shall wither. For thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Damascus, yea, for four, I will not reverse it, because they have threshed Gilead with sledges of iron. Now this actually took place back during the days of Elisha the prophet. What does he say? So will I send a fire into the house of Hazael, and it shall devour the palaces of Ben-Hadad. That did get fulfilled because remember in 2 Kings around chapter 8, we have Elisha the prophet, Ben-Hadad, who had a respect for the prophet Elijah, sent Hazael, his servant, to Elisha to inquire of him if he would recover from his sickness. You know, and it's interesting because President Assad is similar to that of Ben Haddad, if you look at this biblically, because in the case of President Assad, he has a respect for the Christian believers in his country, which is giving honor to the house of Israel, because the Christians in his country are descendants of the house of Israel that ended up going into exile, but in his case, it's the ones that ended up believing Yeshua to be the Messiah. So in, in that case, Assad has a respect towards Yeshua. He ne doesn't necessarily believe uh, this way, but he has a respect for this, just as Hadad, Ben Hadad had a respect for Elisha the prophet. But Hazael, from his own household, not kin or blood related, but from his own people, Elisha prophesied that he would take a wet towel and smother the, the king of Syria. And he did exactly that. And he devoured the palaces of Ben-Hadad. This is exactly what the man did because it was prophesied he would do it. Now, if there's a cyclical fulfillment in this, then we might look at this from a conjecture that perhaps Assad will also be overthrown as his nation has been overthrown already practically by what? The Hazael line. And the Hazael line are the Al-Qaeda and Al-Nusra militants fighting to overthrow his country. Well, the odd thing is, is the very house of Judah in modern state of Israel is on the side of Hazael. Instead of being like Elisha the prophet and being on the side of Ben-Hadad, or in the case of Assad, because Assad has respect for the Christian community. Now, that's just, that's only if that is a cyclical fulfillment. Then he says, now we'll break the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitant from uh, Begeth Aven and him that holdeth the scepter of Beth Aden and the people of Aram or the people of Syria shall go into captivity unto curse, saith the Lord. Now, we've seen the people of Syria go into captivity. They're captive in Europe, not living like normal people, living in camps, living on the sides of the roads. 
even as what is it uh, Micah or is it Haggai says that they will uh, I think it was Micah that says that they will be as the glory of the children no, Isaiah 17 says they'll be as the glory of the children of Israel just like Israel was in search for a home wanders and wandered about so the Syrians have received the same thing all right but then he gets into Gaza thus saith the Lord for three transgressions of Gaza Yea, for four, I will not reverse it, because they, what, carried away captive a whole captivity. Now, in Hebrew, he actually says here, Hagalotam golot shalamah. And if you look at the Septuagint, the word right here, shalamah, right on the very bottom of the screen, hope you guys can see that right here, shalamah, Septuagint says Solomon. Okay? So what was it? And they delivered them up to Adam. See? They actually the word lahasagir or is to close them up. They closed them up. They took them basically as prisoners to Adam, which is interesting because many of them ended up in the West Bank. Well, oddly enough, the West Bank is controlled by Adam. It is controlled by Esau. It's controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. They're the ones that have the authority with the West Bank. And it was what? It was people like Ariel Sharon. It was uh, Ehud Olmert. Uh, it was uh, many in the Israeli cabinet that signed on. And they what? They forsook Gaza. They forsook the Jews living in Gaza and handed them over to, to Edom. Basically, what I look at when I see this, it was also, because I found one plan in there too, where Shimon Perez also was a part of this, and it was the desire of the Catholic Church that they give up Gaza. That was one of their demands, that they give up Gaza. Now, there's another scripture, and I think it's in Zechariah 9, that also speaks about Gaza. Ashkelon shall see it. Boy, behold, the Lord will impoverish her, and he will smite her power into the sea, and she shall be devoured with fire. Now, that's not Ashkelon. He's talking about Tyre. Did build herself as a stronghold, heaped up silver and the dust and the fine gold as a mire of the streets. And behold, the Lord will impoverish her, and he will smite her into the sea, and she shall be devoured with fire. Ashkelon, again, shall see it, and fear Gaza, and fear Gaza also shall be sore pained. And Ekron, for expectation shall be ashamed, and the king shall perish from Gaza, and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. Again, Ashkelon is not even in Gaza. So what's coming? What's coming that's going to cause Ashkelon to not be inhabited? Unless it's something that was fulfilled already in the past. Now, but Zechariah 9, though, also brings up an interesting point as well. Because he says, and the king shall perish, perish from Gaza. Now, I got a little curious, and it's a, it's, this is a major conjecture, okay? I don't say it to be a fact or anything like that. I just think it's interesting. I got curious. What about those Israelites that lived down in Gaza at the time? Could any of them actually have been descendants of David? There could be a strong possibility. Well, it just so happened on King David's genes, I read this article here on momentmag.com about David's genes. And it just so happens to be that down by Gaza was one of the families that have the most direct proof to be descendants of King David going back hundreds of years in their family line. And I just thought that was interesting. I don't say it's so, and I can't say that that's what the scripture is actually implying. Uh, but it's interesting. It's interesting to see. You know, and then not to mention, uh, Shavi Yisrael uh, published this article as well. And I happen to know um, uh, the founder of Shavi Yisrael. And... Uh, it, he wrote on here, do the Palestinians have Jewish roots? It's an article not written by, uh, by, by the friend of mine there at Shri Israel, but uh, by, by another man. And they write, it's actually written by uh, uh, Svi uh, Misenai, I think is the actual uh, one that wrote the article. But they go into in-depth detail 
that they believe. Now, I can't say this is true or not. I do not know. But there are a lot of synagogues in Gaza to this day. Ancient synagogues like this one here that has the Star of David on the synagogue there. Um, but they, there, there is a lot of history that states that a lot of the Palestinians, not counting the ones that, as we've already spoke about, that 50% of the Palestinians that are living there are the, the, you know, and some people say, you know, they're not Palestinians, they're Arabs. All right, I agree with that. I agree with that too. All right. To me, it should be one state, as I've stated many times before. We shouldn't have two states. And as long as the people are willing to comply by the laws of the land, then we should have one state and we should live in peace and harmony together. I mean, after all, you have two million uh, Arab, Arabs living in the modern state of Israel right now. And they're a whole lot better off than the ones that are living in the West Bank or Gaza. You know, so yes, it would be better as one state. And I think this is why God says you have forsaken Gaza. Gaza is forsaken. Um, and that could even apply because if it's really true that you have a lot of Palestinians, not only do they have a lot of DNA that is very similar to the, uh, the Jewish people that are living in the land there as well, but there is a lot of historical documentation that says, even like in this case right here, the reference is an edict in the year 1012, by the Caliph El Hakim, who ordered non-Muslims to either convert or leave, and uh, they say it was uh, uh, what 27% returned to Judaism openly, and even they remain uh, Musti Arabi, the culture of the Arabic uh, uh, religion. And even in uh, I think it was in the 19th century, there were a lot of uh, Arabs that were living in the land there that converted to uh, to the uh, Muslim faith for fear. For fear, they were in a predominantly Arab land, and the argument goes back to some of the Palestinians that they were actually uh, uh, farmers and things of that. And when Rome overthrew the country, they allowed them to stay, the ones that were living out like that, because they were supplying Rome with all their grains and needs and of the, this thing. Whether or not all this is true, I don't know. This is historical documentation that they bring out there, uh, you know, and. I've heard the argument for a long time. I can't say that I'm a full advocate of it, but you know, there's got to be some truth because clearly uh, the, the children of Israel have been dispersed to all the world. And uh, so, and we do, I've got friends that have lived in Israel for, you know, their families are hundreds of years there uh, that still maintain their Jewish identity though, mind you. But uh, I also know too, even my own cousin here in Prague, he, uh, who has Levitical privileges, he says, Steve, you wouldn't believe how many of our family members have changed religions even just to survive. Uh, you know, and this goes back even during the times of the Holocaust. I think this is one reason why you see people like Shimon Perez, who went to a, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, to a Jesuit school, you know. Barry Chamish said, what? What Jewish family would send their child to a Jesuit school? You know, but you never know what people do when it comes to fear. All right? Just, the, the case is just the way it is. And I know my father's family ended up converting to Christianity. Um, now myself, I became the basic first believer in our family, but it wasn't because of forced uh, beliefs. It's because of what God did to my own heart. But these are some of the things that I wanted to share with you and uh, just show you in here that, you know, I, I, let, let me say this as well. I realize that prophecy is going to come about. Just like in the case of Damascus. Damascus is going to be a ruinous heap. But I don't want to be on the side of history there was not a voice against Damascus being destroyed. Because when I shared with you how the prophet Isaiah clearly told us the reason this happens is because we have forgotten the God of our, uh, the, God, the God of Israel. We have, for, we have for, actually, let's look at that again real quick because that's a very important prophecy as well. Um, you know, when we look at Isaiah 17, since we're examining some of these uh, scriptures right now and how it uh, applies both to Syria and to, uh, to, to the people of Gaza. But he says right here, For thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy stronghold. This is why 
they translate this, they plant pleasant plants and did set it with slips of a stranger. You know, it's a spiritual adultery. We allowed the nation of Israel ended up doing just like it was back in the old days when parts of the children of Israel went and uh, 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 went after other gods and served them. We had all kinds of idolatry in Israel. I mean, why do you think the prophets were always raised up? They were always crying out against what, the, what uh, most of the time what the government was doing. You know, look at Ahab bringing Jezebel as Adonian into Israel and bringing idolatry into the nation. And not just, I mean, and even the kings before him, his fathers and, and on back. I mean, the, the country got so corrupted by the leadership and God constantly raising up prophets to, to correct the nation of Israel. And even when Yeshua comes, the Son of God Himself, and He's rejected by the people. You know, and the, and the Benjamites, the children of Benjamin, who was of the house of Judah, they were crying out for His blood. Let His blood be upon us and upon our children. This is why, do you know this is exactly why when Joseph was alive and his brother comes down, Benjamin, he places his own cup in Benjamin's bag. That was a sign. He knew that the Benjamites were going to betray him as far as the Messiah, that they would betray him. They should have embraced him, but there again, everything has a purpose. And had they not betrayed him, then there would, Christ would have never been offered as a sacrifice, and then we would have no atonement. We would have no, no Spirit of God to flow back upon us. We would have no day of Pentecost. So those things had to happen. Even the Romans had to play their parts, uh, the Edomites. You know, so everything happens for a reason, but nonetheless, you know, we need to be a voice, not just out there, you know, popping off at the mouth saying, you know, well, God said he's going to destroy Damascus. Bless God, I'm for it, you know, and then go support a war to go destroy it. You know, even, even in Isaiah, what is it? Isaiah 9, I believe it is. You know, God identifies, if you go to Isaiah chapter 9, this is after you read about the coming of the Messiah and stuff, right? And you get further down, and he starts talking about how that, you know, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, they're going to devour one another's arms. Uh, here it is right here. For the wickedness burneth as the fire, it devoureth the briars and thorns, yea, it kindleth in the thickets of the forest, and they roll upward in the thick clouds of smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts is the land burn up. The people also are as a fuel of fire. No man spareth his brother. And one snatcheth on the right hand and is hungry, and, and he eateth on the left hand. And is not satisfied. They eat every man the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh, Ephraim, Ephraim, Manasseh, and they together are against Judah. Manasseh are, are from Russia. Ephraim, that's European and American. All right? Now, granted, when they say Ephraim and Manasseh, uh, Ephraim also is another terminology generally used by the prophets of old as the house of Israel. So it's more than one tribe. It's not just Ephraim alone. All right? And then it says, and they together are against Judah. Yeah. And, and now listen, we might have President Trump say, and he stands with Israel right now, but does he really stand with the Jewish people, or is he just standing with the, with, with the Zionist? And I say Zionist. There's a good Zionism, and that's the Jews that are wanting to see the coming of the Messiah. But there's also an evil form of Zionism that is only about to destroy all the people in the Middle East and take the land for greed in order to bring about a new world order. And they're doing that for the Pope of Rome. And you better watch who you stand for. I don't want to be on the side of a Zionist that is giving away the land of Israel to the Vatican. Barry Chamish, when he wrote that article I shared with you the other day on the very message of Amos, I shared with you from Barry's own words there, the Vatican was given 60% of Jerusalem under Shimon Peres. So think about it.
And here you have your prophecy right here. They're devouring each other's arm. That's when it says arm, your arm is the strength. It's the war, it's the fighting, it's the battles. It's Ephraim and Manasseh, Russia and, and the US or, or Russia and Europe, they're against each other. And yet they both turn on Israel. But it's not so much the government they turn on. It's the people of Israel they're turning on. It's Judah, the true house of Judah that's returned home. And my black brothers and sisters, listen, I know there are black Jews, but do not get mixed up in this Jesuit doctrine. The Jesuits start more false doctrines than you could ever imagine in order to bring about confusion and division among the people. Because the only way you could be part of Judah was you would, you would have to not believe that Yeshua was the Messiah. You would have never been able to believe that Yeshua was the Messiah because Romans 11 said that they're blinded for your sake. And there has not a better, been a better evangelizing people in all of America than the black people of America. According to statistics, 80% of black America, of black America claims to be believers of Jesus Christ. Now tell me how in the world. The other 20% mostly are beliefs in, in uh, Muslim religion. 80%! How can you be a believer in Yeshua and say you're the house of Judah when the house of Judah, according to Paul in Romans 11, says that they will be blind until the Messiah opens their eyes, and that's according to Zechariah 12's prophecy as well. They weep and mourn because they'd rejected him and they didn't realize it. And these Jewish people that live in Israel right now, I realize that there's some false ones there. Don't kid yourself. I know that too. And most of them are in the government positions that are the false ones. Yeah, because even they secretly believe under Catholicism. Didn't know that, did you? Well, yeah, you should. If you listen to this channel, you ought to know that by now. All right? So this is the whole point, guys. They're trying to, you know, don't be deceived by this, this false doctrine here. That's a Jesuit-inspired doctrine. And I know it is because I also know that the Catholic Church has also sent a lot of black families into Israel to pose as Jews, but secretly are Catholics. I know that for a fact as well. And they've also sent in people, and I know people personally that are converting to Judaism to try to get the people, the Jewish people, to think that the Bible, the Bible that we have today is false. Yeah. But something about the Catholic Church wants to come up with a new Bible. You know, you guys have heard it out there. I guess they call it conspiracy theory, stuff like that. Uh, you know, but yeah, that's, that's true. Anyway, all right, guys, I've done work y'all over. I'm just going to quickly look at comments here to see if anything's going on. Um, and, uh, you know, but uh, uh, do keep in mind, you know, if, if, this, if the ministry here is a blessing to you, do support the work we do. We do need your help. I, I say it sometimes too often, and sometimes I don't say anything for a long time, but I do ask that you kind of remember us in your giving there because it's what helps us to keep going. And it's Israeli News, Israeli News Live. Dot org. You can uh, give there if, if, it, if the Lord leads you. Uh, even on this channel, on, Danuna, on uh, YouTube, Israeli News Live here on YouTube, there's a little place there. I think it goes to Google Plus. And, uh, of course, patreon.com forward slash Israeli News Live. That's another place as well. So anyway, um, all right, blessings to all of you guys. We love you so much. And... Uh, uh, Stephen Ben Noon at gmail.com. You can also do Israeli News Live at gmail.com. Uh, I don't see that one as much. I know I should, but uh, it's just the way it's set up on my desktop there. So, but I'm always trying to look at both of them. And like I said, if I miss it, uh, please forgive me because I, I may have three, three, four hundred emails come in a day. So it just takes a lot of time. And sometimes I think I miss people and never get back to them. And I really hate that, uh, especially if it's prayer requests. If, you, if you've got a prayer request, please put that in your subject line. Um, you know, even if I'm not able to respond to you, I want to pray for people that have need of prayer. 
Uh, I'm a very strong believer in that. So definitely put that in your subject line. So, because I sometimes I'll just try to scan down through there real quick just to see if there's anybody with you know a serious need of prayer. Uh, especially there are so many people that write with life-threatening issues. Uh, and they trust that if I would pray for them, God would hear my prayers. And so I do want them to be prayed for. All right, guys, we love you so much. City that sits on seven hills. Well, Rome is definitely the city that sits on seven hills, but I know there's more. There's one or two more places on the earth that sit on seven hills as well. But I do believe that Rome fits the bill for that. God bless you. Love you all. You guys tremendously. Shalom, shalom, and Erev Tov.